risk management. This is a super important topic in security, doubly so in the cloud. We as security professionals have a colossal challenge. How do we best protect all the assets across an organization, especially when a bunch of those assets are somewhere in the cloud and are being managed and secured by service providers? We never have unlimited budgets or an unlimited amount of time available to protect, to perfectly protect everything. And when an organization outsources systems and data, they lose a large degree of control over protecting those the assets. But they are still accountable for protecting those assets. So how do we best protect the assets within the organization and assets that have been outsourced? One super useful method to help us figure this out is, of course, risk management. Risk management is an essential component of any comprehensive security program as it enables organizations to prioritize their security efforts and allocate resources effectively. Risk management can help an organization determine what controls should be in place to protect their assets and then ensure their service providers are effectively implementing and operating those controls in the cloud. Let's start with some useful definitions in risk management. Risk profile is a comprehensive evaluation of an organization's risk tolerance, capacity, and preferences. A risk profile serves as a guide for decision-making within an organization, helping determine what types and level of risk are acceptable. Risk appetite is the overall amount and type of risk that an organization is willing to endure in order to meet their strategic goals and objectives. So risk appetite is broad and strategic. And risk tolerance is the amount and type of risk that an organization is willing in order is willing to accept in order to meet specific operational objectives. So risk tolerance is focused on specific operational risks. Now, risk management is fundamentally focused on the identification, assessment, and prioritization of risks and the economical application of resources to minimize, monitor, and control the probability and or impact of those risks. At the 10,000 foot level, It's helpful to think about risk management comprising three major steps, asset valuation, risk analysis, and treatment. Let's go through these three steps, starting with asset valuation. Asset valuation is conceptually incredibly simple, a sign of value to each asset. In other words, figure out how valuable each asset is to the organization so that we can then rank those assets from most on down to least valuable. Simple idea super hard to do in practice. There are two major ways that we can rank assets, quantitative and qualitative analysis. Quantitative analysis is where we assign monetary values to each asset. We say this asset is worth a buck and this asset is worth 1.8 million Canadian pesos. Quantitative analysis is absolutely the preferred method. We would ideally love to assign a nice dollar value to every asset, unfortunately. For the vast majority of assets, this just isn't possible with any sort of reasonable accuracy. Can you confidently say your organization's reputation is worth $736 million or this data is worth exactly 2,849 pesos or this critical application is worth you know, 13.18 million euros? No. For most assets, we have absolutely, we, we, we can absolutely not assign a monetary value to them. We may know something is valuable, maybe even very valuable, but assigning an exact dollar value is nigh impossible. And that is why the vast majority of the time we use qualitative analysis to rank assets. Qualitative analysis is simply a relative ranking system where you compare assets and you say, well, this asset is more valuable than that one, which is less valuable than that one. You rank assets relative to each other. And you often create categories like high, medium, and low and sort assets into these categories. Once you've completed asset valuation, you will have a nicely ranked list of assets. And now it's time to move on to step two of risk management, which is risk analysis. Risk analysis is where you identify the risks associated with each asset. To identify and understand the risks associated with each asset, you need to look at four things. Threats vulnerabilities, impact, and likelihood. Threats are any potential danger. Threats are events, situations, or actions that have the potential to cause harm or damage an organization's assets, operations, or reputations. 
Threats can come from a wide range of sources, such as natural disasters, cyber attacks, fraud, theft, or human error. We can use threat modeling methodologies to help us systematically identify and prioritize the threats associated with a given asset. We'll talk about different threat modeling methodologies in more detail in the third mind map of domain four. The next major piece that we need to look at as part of risk analysis is vulnerabilities. A vulnerability is a weakness that exists. Vulnerabilities are weaknesses or gaps in an organization's security or control systems that can be exploited by a threat to cause harm or to damage the organization's assets, operations, or reputation. Two techniques that can be used to systematically identify vulnerabilities are vulnerability assessment and penetration testing, which we'll talk about in detail in the second mind map of domain four. Likelihood or probability is simply the chance that a particular risk event will occur. It is a measure of the likelihood or potential risk turning into an actual event. And the final piece we have to look at to fully understand a risk is the impact. Impact refers to the potential harm or damage that could result from particular risk occurring. Impact is essentially whatever bad thing is going to happen to the organization as a result of a risk occurring. Downtime, reputational damage, data integrity issues, a breach, ransomware. The list unfortunately goes on and on and on. All right, so as part of risk analysis, we're going to come up with a giant list of risks. We need to rank these risks to figure out which risks are of greater or lesser concern. There are two techniques we can use to rank the risks, quantitative and qualitative analysis, the same techniques we talked about for ranking assets. Quantitative risk analysis is where you try to calculate exactly how much a given risk is going to cost the organization per year. It's super helpful if we can calculate this, as it makes it so much easier to determine which controls are cost justified to put in place to mitigate a given risk. There is a super simple formula you can use to calculate how much a risk is going to cost the organization per year. It's known as the ALE calculation, the Annualized Loss Expectancy Calculation, and you definitely need to know this uh, formula for the exam. To calculate ALE, you first need to calculate the SLE, the single loss expectancy, which is simply how much is a risk going to cost the organization if the risk occurs once. To calculate the SLE, you multiply the asset value times the exposure factor. The asset value is simply what the asset is worth, and the exposure factor is a percentage that represents what percent of the asset you expect to lose if the risk occurs. And exposure factor of 10% would mean you expect to lose 10% of the asset if the risk occurs. Or an exposure factor of 100% would mean you expect to lose all of the asset if the risk occurs. So to calculate SLE, simply multiply the asset value with the exposure factor, and that will tell you how much it's going to cost the organization if the risk occurs once. But of course, the whole point of this ALE formula is to calculate how much a risk is going to cost the organization annually per year. So we need to multiply the SLE times the ARO. The ARO is the annualized rate of occurrence. The ARO simply represents how many times per year you expect a risk to occur. If you expect the risk to occur once per year, the ARO will be one. If you expect the risk to occur five times per year, the ARO would be five. So this is a super simple formula that we would love to use all the time, but we can't. Because the three simple numbers we need, asset value, exposure factor, and ARO, are often totally impossible to determine with any sort of reasonable accuracy. And that is why (laughs) we're forced to use qualitative analysis most of the time. And like I said before, qualitative analysis is a relative ranking system. It's not great, but it's a whole lot better than nothing. This now brings us to the third major step in risk management, treatment. Treatment is where we figure out how to treat the risks we've identified, do something about the risks. There are four major treatment methods, avoid, transfer, mitigate, and accept. Let's go through them. Starting with risk avoidance. Risk avoidance means implementing measures to prevent the risk from occurring or choosing not to engage in activities that would cause the risk to occur. Don't want to face the risk of near certain death of jumping out of an airplane with no parachute? Don't jump out of an airplane with no parachute. That's risk avoidance. (laughs) Don't want to face the risk of the cloud? Don't move stuff to the cloud. 
risk transference means buying an insurance policy. An organization can purchase an insurance policy to transfer the financial burden of a particular risk to their insurer. Super critical to remember from a security perspective, though. You can never transfer or delegate accountability. So if an organization has purchased an insurance policy, they're not transferring the accountability for a risk to their insurer. They'll just get a payout, hopefully, if something goes sideways. Risk mitigation is where we spend the vast majority of our time as security professionals because risk mitigation is all about implementing various controls to try and reduce the risk. We'll talk through a bunch of different controls in just a moment here. Preventative controls, detective controls, corrective controls, etc. So risk mitigation is about reducing the risk by implementing various controls, which raises an important question. Can we ever find the perfect set of controls that will completely eliminate a risk? The answer is no. Which brings up another important term, residual risk. Residual risk is the risk that is left over after we've implemented mitigating controls. There are three major methods we can use to implement mitigating controls. And these are sort of essentially the categories of these types of controls. So administrative means policies, procedures, and other organizational practices that we put in place to manage risks. Administrative controls are things like security policies and employee training and awareness. Technical or logical controls are the technologies we put in place to manage risk. Things like firewalls, intrusion detection systems, encryption, automated backups, hypervisor, security systems, etc. And physical security controls are the physical security stuff we put in place, such as fences, cameras, locks, fire suppression systems, etc. So we can implement controls using any of these three major methods, administrative, technical slash logical, and physical. And one more layer here to define before we get into the actual controls. We can categorize the controls into two major groups, safeguards and countermeasures. Safeguards are the controls we put in place to try and ensure a risk doesn't occur. So within this category of safeguards, we have the following three controls. Directive controls are measures that provide guidance and instruction to personnel on how to handle risks. Directive controls direct behavior. How do we tell someone within an organization what to do? Policies. Policies are the perfect example of directive controls. Deterrent controls, here's the keyword, discourage. Discourage individuals from engaging in risky behavior. Keyword here is discourage, obviously. Deterrent controls don't prevent someone from doing something, they discourage them. A perfect example of a deterrent control is a sign that says, private property, all trespassers will be shot. That sign wouldn't prevent anyone, or wouldn't prevent me, for instance, from walking onto a property. But if that property was in the US where everyone has 37 guns and there's no public health care, it would definitely discourage me. Sorry for picking on the US here yet again, but I'm a Canadian. I'm allowed to. We're like the annoying younger, younger sibling of the US. All right, now, preventative controls are measures that aim to prevent, stop a risk from occurring. Examples of preventative controls include razor wire topped fences, login mechanisms and firewalls. Okay, now going back up to the categories here, how do we can categorize these controls again? As I said, we can categorize the controls into two major groups, safeguards and countermeasures. Countermeasures are the controls we put in place to detect and respond to a risk that has occurred. So within this category of, uh, of countermeasures, we have the following three controls. Detective controls are measures that help to identify risks that have occurred or are currently ongoing. Examples of detective controls include SIM systems, security information and event management systems, intrusion detection systems, smoke detectors, etc. Corrective controls are measures that aim to reduce the negative impact of risks after they've occurred. A perfect example of a corrective control would be a fire suppression system that activates to put out a fire, right? It's minimizing the risk, the impact of the risk by putting out the fire. Recovery controls are measures that help organizations recover from the impacts of a risk occurring, getting back to business as usual. A good example of a recovery control is a disaster recovery plan, right? This is a plan that we put in place to help recover from some bad thing happening. And finally, compensating controls are the measures we put in place to mitigate the negative impacts of risks when other controls are not effective or feasible. So essentially, compensating controls make up for the lack of a better control. Okay, now the final piece to cover related to controls, functional and 
assurance. Every good control is supported by these two aspects, functional and assurance. The functional aspect refers to the function that a control is meant to perform. For example, what is the function of a firewall? Firewalls control the flow of traffic between two network segments. So a good firewall control is going to provide this functionality. The ability to control the flow of traffic. Any good control is obviously going to perform some sort of useful function. The second aspect that any good control needs to provide is assurance. We need to be able to get assurance that a control is working correctly on an ongoing basis. So going back to a firewall, how would we typically get assurance that a firewall is working correctly on an ongoing basis? Typically by logging and then monitoring the logs. So that's why any good control needs to include, or like this is why most firewalls, for instance, include logging and monitoring capabilities. So we can get assurance that the firewall is working correctly on an ongoing basis. And any good control needs to provide this assurance aspect. All right, that finally wraps up our discussion of risk mitigation. So let's zoom back up to the final risk treatment method, risk acceptance. Risk acceptance is a deliberate decision to accept a certain level of risk and its potential consequences. Who within an organization should be accepting the risk associated with a particular asset? Mm, the asset owner. Owners are accountable for the security of an asset. So owners are best positioned to deliberately accept a risk or not. And the final item, residual risk, is the risk that remains after compensating controls have been implemented. There is always going to be residual risk, as you can never find the perfect set of controls that will completely eliminate a risk. Very importantly, residual risk should be accepted by the asset owner. All right, there we go. That's an overview of risk management within domain one, covering the most critical concepts you need to know for the CCSP exam. If you found this mind map video helpful, you can hit the thumbs up button. We'd appreciate it. And if you want to be notified when we release additional videos in this mind map series, then please subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notifications. If you're looking for the easiest way to get your CCSP certification, then check out our CCSP masterclass. It's awesome. Link in the description below. Thanks very much and all the very best in your studies.